Hi everyone, welcome. My name is John Mearsma, and I want to welcome you to what is a session border controller, Cube, Cisco Unified Border Element, and how does it work? I'm a Cisco collaboration network instructor at Sunset Learning. I've taught Cisco now for nearly two decades. I started out as a routing and switching user, person, administrator, instructor, and moved into collaboration. I was fascinated by, well, I was bored. Who am I kidding? I was bored with routing and switching. There's only so many times you can explain EIGRP. And then I heard, hey, Cisco has, sells more telephones than any other organization. And I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know Cisco made phones. And this was a long time ago. So I said, ah, oh, maybe I'll get into voice over IP. And so uh, about 15 years ago, I started thinking about it. So maybe I've been in collaboration a little longer and it was just one of those things that I wanted to get into. And just as decades ago, everyone needed, I realized when I got into routing and switching, hey, this is, this is great because every company on earth has to have a network or they need one. They either have one or need one. And every one of those organizations needs a network administrator. You ever try to talk to a dentist about configuring their network? They all need administrators. Well, that's true today with collaboration. Look at what we're doing. We're collaborating, talking about collaboration, using SIP to talk about SIP so that we can see how cubes work because we're using cubes. We're collaborating as we talk about collaborating because all organizations either have this or need this technology. It is what it is. Traditional telephony is like Kaiser Sose, just disappearing. And what's left, what's replacing it, are SIP trunks, cubes, which brings us to our discussion today. See, I could show you or tell you a bunch of stuff, but I wanna show you. I wanna show you how to configure a SIP cube. Take a router, which is what a cube is, it's just Cisco router, that we're going to configure to act as a cube, to be able to route calls to and from the public switch telephone network. Then we're going to go into Unified Communication Manager, build a trunk, we're gonna set it up from scratch. Here's how to take a call manager, a router, turn it into a cube solution, send and receive calls. We'll pull a SIP trace or two. We'll take a look at the results. So that's what we're going to do. Before I get started, I wanna make sure that all of us are on the same page. So I'm gonna be moving fairly quickly. Oh, which brings me to the point that I just blew past. In addition to our courses, you're also going to get access to the one year membership. All students get access, whether you use the promo code or not. All students get access to one year of our next community, which means all of our courses, all of our recorded courses, which are all of our courses that we, that we teach. So if you're taking a collaboration course and you're like, you know, I wanna know more about data center. I wanna know, I wanna get my CCNA or at least understand what's the big deal. You can watch the videos, the entire CCNA, the entire data center, all of our collaboration courses. Maybe you don't take the SIP course, maybe you take another course and you watch the SIP course. It's all available. And in addition to the courses, you'll also find our tech talks. This conversation, this talk will make its way into our next database. So you'll be able to go through what it is that we're going to demonstrate. And you can stop it, slow it down, speed it up, say, okay, okay, what did he do there? Okay, and so as I move through it fairly quickly, you'll have access to it in the future if you wanna take a look at anything in the more leisurely fashion. So what I'm going to do is just briefly show you what it is that we're going to accomplish, then we're going to do it. What we've got is a unified communication manager server, also known as call manager, and its job is to be the brains behind the entire collaboration operation. It controls endpoints, phones, video units. These objects register to Unified Communication Manager. They can speak skinny if they're Cisco proprietary. They can speak SIP. Any vendor can use SIP, including Cisco. Cisco's realized we should use SIP too. But you don't need to have SIP phones in order to use a cube. This is just the relationship between the server and the endpoints. Then in the old days, when we wanted to connect to the public switch telephone network, the landline, if you wanted to connect to the outside world, 
you needed to, if we had somebody out here that we wanted to talk with, we needed to physically connect to the public switch telephone network. And in order to do that in a Cisco environment, we use a Cisco router. You get a router, you buy a voice module, you slide it in the back of the router, just like a screwdriver, unscrew a few screws, put the voice module in, screw it back in, turn the router on, then you can plug in the telephony. And now your router is also a gateway because these devices over here are computers. These guys speak TCP IP, SIP, skinny, H323, MGCP, they're computers. This is not, this is analog or digital. So you need something that can convert. And that's what a gateway does. Gateways. Routers also have the ability to speak TCP IP. So because of that, we can connect the router to, to the same network as Unified Communication Manager. This is Ethernet. It's a LAN. And then we have telephony, which many names for telephony. We're just going to call it the PSTN, Landline, Alexander Graham Bell. And then the, the router is acting as the gateway. Now, in order to make this work, we had to go to Unified Communication Manager and decide how we're going to talk to this router. We could use H.323 or we could use MGCP. Two different ways of dealing with this router as a gateway. These are the protocols. Now, in, that was the old way, the legacy solution. We still need to communicate with the PSTN, but now we're no longer bringing it right to our doorstep. Instead, the PSTN is out here and the WAN, usually the WAN provider, your carrier, your WAN carrier will be involved and they'll say, oh yeah, you can connect to our WAN. And oh, by the way, if you need to call the public Swiss telephone network, go to this and they'll give you an IP address. I'm just going to make one up. 10.1.1.16. And they'll say, okay, if you want to connect to the public switch telephone network, that's us. We're the ones, we're the gateway. You just need to connect to that IP address. And so over the WAN, we're going to have IP here and then IP there. So now our router, we're still using the same router. The router's still sitting there like, hey, what happened? The router is no longer connected to the public switch telephone network. It's IP, IP. And so what it does is it acts as a deliminator. We're going to configure the router to speak SIP to Unified Communication Manager. We're gonna speak Unified Communication Manager to speak SIP to the router. The router is gonna speak SIP to the carrier. The carrier is gonna speak SIP back. And now we have a cube, a Cisco Unified Border Element. And what it does is it acts as a deliminator, a separator, a boundary, a DMARC because the carrier doesn't see any of our internal IP addresses or our devices. They don't have any idea that that exists. They just have a SIP connection to the cube. We, on the other hand, don't see the carrier. We don't see their IP addresses. We just see the connection to the cube internally. Both sides just see their connection to the cube. Both sides just see their connection. Now, what we're going to do in this demonstration is configure the cube. So we have to look at it as the middleman perspective. We, got it. we have to look at it as, okay, what exactly is going to be happening? And this is the part that I wish I had more time, so you just have to bear with me. The PSTN are going to have numbers like 911, uh, 2 through 9, X, 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 well, routers use dots, so I'll, I'll use dots but they're going to have 10 digit local numbers, one, two through nine, dot, 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 long distance, and zero, one, one for international. So these are the types of calls that are all gonna go out to the public switch telephone network. They have an IP address of 10.250.250 they have an IP address of 10.250.250.201. So there's an object out here with this IP address. We're going to make a SIP trunk two, and we're also going to expect calls from. Then we're going to have our organization, which is our unified communication manager and our phones, 
and we're going to speak SIP to and from. To and from. These guys, this is going to be the 10.3.5.15. And then the phone numbers are going to be 513-555. And then we've got 2001 in our demonstration. We'll just use that phone. So we need to make some, we need to know the IP addresses. In order to do all this, we have to know the phone numbers and the IP addresses of these guys so that we can configure the cube because the cube is going to look in our demonstration, the cube is going to look at the phone number and then decide where to send the call. So if it's minding its own business and all of a sudden a call comes in, hey, where, where are you going? Oh, I'm just trying to go to 513-555-2001. Oh, okay, uh, I know where that is. That needs to go to this IP address and he'll pass it on to call manager who will then pass it on to the phone. If the cube is minding its own business, and a call comes in the other direction. Hey, where are you going? Oh, I'm dialing 911, just because it's simple. I mean, you could dial any number. Uh, one, it's just less numbers to write down, so I like to use it, but any number. Oh, this number, that matches that pattern, has to go to that guy. So the cube is gonna look at numbers and decide where to send the call. Those are, and in, in order to do that, we're gonna make dial peers. Four sets of dial peers on a cube four sets. Dial peers come in, cube has to match the call and have an inbound dial peer. What does it need to do? It needs to speak SIP. We could decide what codec to use. Anything that affects this call, we could decide what DTMF settings to apply for inbound. Then the cube needs to know where to send the call, so it has to have an outbound dial peer, which tells the cube where to send the call. What IP address based on what number? So we have to tell the cube, look for called numbers, look for called numbers, destination, and when you find them, called numbers will match inbound dial peer. Then called numbers will be used to match outbound dial peers. Okay, so we have those two. Then we have to think third dimensionally because calls are going to be coming in the other direction. People are going to try to call us back. And we have to look at the called number again and match an inbound dial peer. Then look at a called number and match an outbound dial peer. So at least we're going to be looking at the called numbers, the dialed numbers. They will help us match in and out. They will help us match in and out. And then we have to decide in each of these, what codec, what protocol, any, any settings that we want. There's hundreds, there's not hundreds, but there's dozens of options that we could configure on each of these dial peers. We're just gonna configure a few, but we have to match based on called numbers. So with that, let's get started. I'm gonna show you the commands, I'm gonna log into the cube, and then I'm gonna show you the commands that we're going to use to configure it. So let me grab those and we'll get started. And dump. So let me open up my Telnet session. We've got our cube here. I'll change the font so that it's large enough to read. And we can see if we do show run, there's really nothing on this cube. I mean, it's just a router that has some just basic, all it really has is IP addresses. There's nothing there. It's got some IP addresses, um, that's all. No dial peers, let me change this so that we see everything. There we go. 
just some IP addresses, no dial peers, nothing there. So that's what we're going to be starting from. It just needs to be a, um, just a router that has IP addresses, plain old router. And so from there, we're going to configure it. And I will show you the commands that we're going to use. And then I'll paste them into the router as well. So I'll show you the commands. And then um, we'll paste it into the router. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to go into the router, go to global configuration, go into voice service VoIP, and we're going to configure the router. One of the things that we can do is to prevent toll fraud, we can assign IP addresses. Hey router, oops, I'm not sharing my screen. One of the things that we can do is, hey router, only, only trust certain um, IP addresses. Or we could just say, yeah, for the intents and, uh, of our purpose, for all intents and purposes, we're gonna trust everybody. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna say, don't specify trusted IP addresses, although you could certainly do that in a production environment. You could list specific IP addresses and then it would only trust calls coming in from trusted sources. I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna take the commands that we use in the, uh, the lab guide. And we'll get started here. So we'll copy these. Oh, then we're also going to tell it to go ahead and be a border element, to be a cube. And then we need to allow connection SIP to SIP. This is the critical command. Some of these are optional. Some of these are not. The allow SIP to SIP is not optional. That tells the router that if a SIP message comes in, you can actually send an entirely different SIP message out. If you don't add this command, it doesn't work. Nothing we're going to do would work. The router would receive the SIP call and go, oh, you're talking to me? What do you want? Instead of, oh, I need to pass this on to somebody else. Nobody's trying to, I mean, when's the last time you picked up the phone and called a router? Nobody does. So it, it needs to send it out. And so we have to tell it to do that. So we're gonna go in, put that in, and then um, we'll be able to apply those. And then moving on, we have the option of using address hiding if we want. That's something that I like to do. Again, this is an optional command, but it simply says, look, if you send a message to me, to the cube, and there's something wrong, I'm not gonna send you a response with my address. I'm not gonna respond to you. I'm gonna be better than that. And the reason is, is people might be phishing. They might be trying to send negative messages or bad messages or, to get a response, to learn your IP address. Oh, okay, he responded, he took the bait. Now we know the IP address of the router and we can look for a weakness. This says, no, I'm not even gonna reply. If you don't have your, this says, if you don't have your SIP together, I ain't saying SIP to you. Okay, so that's what that command does. Then from there, um, we have the option if we wanted to, we could turn off we could turn off the H.323 if we wanted to. Again, we're not using H.323, although it is possible. You could use a cube with H.323, but you would lose a lot of functionality. So we're gonna turn that off so that it's not even an option. Not a required set of commands, but it is something that we're going to do. Turn it off. Then now we're going to create a group of codecs. And by the way, I'll send you these commands. I'll make it so if you want to, I'll save this file that I'm building. I'll save it. And then if you want to download a copy of it, I'll put it in the chat window when we're done. You can download it. And then you have the commands to look at yourself. Because I think that can be very useful as examining a configuration and seeing each command. The, uh, the class codec is just an option. I mean, remember the route predictability is what we're trying to accomplish. Calls come in, hey, if you dial this number, we'll send you here. And oh, by the way, here's a list of codecs you have to choose from. You don't have to do this. The phones can choose their own codec or you could take this as an opportunity to implement policy, which is what we'll do. 
So we'll say, you, you can choose G711 MULA or G729. Just pick one. We're, we're gonna give you two codecs to choose from. And then we can reference this voice class in our dial peers. Uh, from there, we could say that we could configure a media activity timer so that, or media inactivity timer. So if there's, if a call just drops and there's not a proper SIP call release, which is a buy request and then a response, if that doesn't happen, if something just stops, freezes, eventually SIP will time out. It, it's built in the invite, it's usually 30 minutes. If I don't hear from you within 30 minutes, I'll eventually drop the call. But that's a long time to wait so we could provide a timer that says, listen, if you don't see any RTP passing through you, if you don't see any media for five minutes, if there's no media, I mean, who's silent that long? Who just sits on the phone that silent for five? So we could set a timer that would end the call sooner than a normal SIP timeout, which is what uh, we're going to do. Not a mandatory command, but certainly a, uh, a decent one. Now we're going to get into configuring our, uh, our cube. We are on. Now, cubes have to know the IP address of the devices they're communicating with. We can put them in dial peers. You could put in specific IP addresses. Let's say I have three, three devices. I'd have to make three dial peers. If you dial long distance, go to this IP address. What if that doesn't work? Well, I have to make another dial peer. Go to that IP address. What if that doesn't work? We'd have to make a third dial peer. Go to that IP address. Or we could take IP addresses and group them into server groups and then use that single dial peer. Hey, if you dial this number, use this IP address. If that doesn't work, we can have multiple IP addresses in a server group. So I'm gonna use a server group. If you had multiple, I could just list them here. You could just say, hey, if that doesn't work, go to dot 16. If that doesn't work, go to dot 17. And so I can then reference this server group in one dial peer and choose which of these or how to distribute calls over multiple IP addresses. So we can use server groups, it saves us from having to configure many dial peers. We have to create two server groups, one for our call manager and then one for the PSTN because calls are going to be sent in both directions. If you dial an internal number, go to this IP address. If you dial the outside world, go to the public switch telephone, the PSTN device. So we're gonna make those dial peers or those server groups, and then we'll reference those in our dial peers. And if you highlight anything within your Telnet SSH window, you have to go hot, copy your commands again. If you do any of that, it erases everything that you copied and you have to go back and do it again. So we've created the server groups pointing in both directions. Now we're going to create pattern maps. And pattern maps are going to be phone numbers. Same concept. Instead of having to make multiple dial peers, one for each number. If you dial this number, go here. If you dial another number, go to the same place. It's two dial peers. We can instead group multiple numbers into a pattern map. So if you dial this number or this number, we can reference a single dial peer. So these combined give us the ability to condense the amount of dial peers. In fact, you only need two dial peers in most situations, just two total depending on what it is you're configuring. Usually you can get away with two dial peers. One dial peer will be in and out. Another dial peer will be in, out, in the other direction. Just two. So we're gonna say, hey, if you call our, if our, if you call our internal numbers, reference this pattern map. Then we're going to say, if you call the outside, local, long distance, international, or emergency, use the other pattern map. So if you call, uh, that is gonna be used for international, long distance, local, 10 digit local, and emergency. If you call any of those numbers, 
So we've got our patterns, we've got our server groups. Now we need to combine these into our dial peers. And so we'll do that. We're gonna have to make dial peers and you can put descriptions on them if you want. You can put a description and we're gonna reference the first pattern map. So if the call number is going to be any of these, okay, so we're gonna make our first, then that's gonna be used for outbound. Destination called number is how you match outbound dial peers. Incoming called number is how you match inbound dial peers. So one dial peer is gonna be outbound if you call these numbers. But it's also gonna be used incoming dial peer if you call these numbers. So if we're sitting here, and this is the one that's gonna be pointing towards CUCM, if we dial any of the uh, outside numbers, if you dial any of those, then um, this will be the inbound. So, oh, you're calling these guys? Yeah, inbound dial peer. Great, what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna use SIP, okay? And then from here, there's many options. So SIP is mandatory, you gotta use SIP, but then whether or not you wanna choose what session target, or excuse me, session protocol, you could say, yeah, use TCP, UDP, TLS. Okay, fine. You have other options. You could just specify, since we're on options, you could specify what DTMF to re, uh, relay to use. Remember, codecs that are used for human speech are able to take sound waves that humans make and turn it into zeros and ones. We create waves, codecs, code and decode sound, and turn them into instructions, which are then put into IP packets. And then they get layer four, RTP, layer three, layer two headers, and we send 50 of these a second. And those are RTP because of their layer four RTP header. Layer three IP address, layer two MAC address. And then the data comes from the coding of the sound wave. Well, this works great for human speech, but these codecs cannot necessarily interpret, some of them cannot interpret two different frequencies at the same time, which is what happens when you press a digit. Do, dual tone multiple frequencies, two different frequencies at the same time. The codex like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. No idea. And so um, we're not able to send digits during the call. If you want to log into your voicemail system or you want to check your account balance, this, you press your, I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It has happened to me recently. You press the buttons and nothing happens the DTMF isn't working. So we could specify how to solve that issue. That's one way, using name telephony event, the device will actually send a packet that has a layer three, layer four, layer two header, but instead of putting in zeros and ones from the call, it will actually make mark this uh, as a name telephony event. It'll give it a 101 marking and it'll have binary code in there, which the other side can interpret, oh, hey, you're not a voice packet it can then read that and understand what digit you pressed. It's just one possible way of doing this. And then we'll also reference the codec class. So whoever uses this dial peer, go ahead and pick a codec from our class, which was G711 MULA and G729. These are optional, but that's why we're doing this, to define parameters. Match based on called number. How do you know what dial peer works? Remember, calls come in, router has to match an inbound dial peer. Always look at the called number. Well, this is usually what's matched. There can be other things, but usually the destination is matched. Call comes in, look at the called number. Look at the dial peer that has the incoming command, incoming called anything in pattern map two, which is that. So this will be the inbound dial peer. 101 will be in. Great, what are we gonna do? We're going to use that codec, that NTP, UDP, and use SIP. All right, cool, we'll do all of those. 
For outbound, look at the call number, but for outbound, it's like that blue fish. He, the router completely forgets everything it just did, everything, and then says, okay, does any dial peer have the destination command that matches the called number? Same called number. Now, who's got the destination command? Pattern map one, that is not where this number is. This is in pattern map two. So this is not the outbound dial peer. It will be the in, but not the out. But it does have a destination. It does say destination pattern map one, which remember, if I were to scroll up, pattern map one is 513555, two dot, dot, dot. Well, that would be going in this direction. It would be the outbound. When somebody from here dials 513555, Two zero zero one. Call the router is going to go. Hey, does anybody have a destination? I do. do. Does the pattern map match the called number? Yes. Well, then you're the outbound. I am. Yes. Congratulations. You're the outbound. So dial peer one hundred and one will do double duty. It'll be in for some, out for others. Not the same call. Different calls, but some calls it'll be the inbound. Other calls it'll be the outbound. Same dial peer. No problem. Just because the last thing I'll mention, I'll throw in this that really, really, really confused me. Just because all of these things are listed, like where to send the call, doesn't mean the router's asking. The router is not asking, where should I send this call? So just because there are certain lines in here that are gonna say, here, send it to this IP address. When it comes to an inbound dial peer, the router's not looking at where, is not asking where to send the call. That's not an inbound question. He's only looking at how to treat these, this inbound call. What codec, what DTMF, what transport, what SIP, or what protocol. I'm not interested in where to send it. So even though we're gonna add a session server group that is gonna point to call manager, it doesn't mean the call is gonna go right back because the router's not asking where to send the call. It's an inbound question. You don't decide where to eat for breakfast. You don't decide where to go to dinner at breakfast. You're thinking orange juice and toast, not lasagna or spaghetti. It's not something you think about at that moment. So one dial peer, it really confused me to go, well, if this dial peer says go to, doesn't want to have to go to that IP address? Not on an inbound, only on an out. Speaking of the command, the server group, we'll add that. Server group session uh, or server group one, which is going to be this. So now we can see just because you matched incoming doesn't mean we're gonna send it right back to you because we're not even asking this question on incoming. We are gonna ask it on outbound though. Did you dial one of these numbers? Yes, well, that's an outbound question. Where do I send it? to that server. Um, I actually almost did that by mistake. Server group one is we're using, I'm using router two, server three. I gotta make sure my IP addresses are correct. So let me copy this in and I can fix that if I need to. You gotta make sure your IP addresses match. Let's copy this in. Then, one of the great things about using this is I can look and if I did make a mistake in my server group, I can copy it, paste it, remove it and just put it back. So I can say no IP and then Okay, and now we should be in good shape. Okay, so we have that dial peer. The last thing that we're going to do is bind everything. We're gonna bind everything to our interface, gigabit zero. Everything has to be bound so that when a call comes in, when a call comes in, 
we're going to say, and then we respond. Oh, okay, sure, I'll respond to you. I'll give you a SIP request, SIP response. The IP address that we're gonna respond from is gonna be the one that's on gigabit zero, which is that. That's the IP address on gigabit zero. And so we need to tell our call manager or any device that makes a SIP trunk to us, they're going to point to that IP address. Routers have many IP addresses. And we have to tell the router, no, 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 respond with that IP address because they're gonna be pointing to it and they have to match. If you don't put this command in, the router can respond with another IP address and the SIP trunk would say, hey, I didn't send, I sent it to this and you're responding with another IP address. If you respond with a different interface and now they don't match and your SIP trunk won't work because I sent it to one IP address and if you don't respond from that address, then I don't know who you are. So we wanna make sure that we bind and that we get our IP addresses perfect because that'll cause it to fail. So we're gonna bind this and I'll just put all this back in. Doesn't hurt anything to do it that way, even though it's mostly already in. So now we're, we've bound everything. So that's one dial peer. Then I'm gonna make another, I'm just gonna copy the other dial peer, change a few settings. It's one of the benefit of having this, you can just edit, you can just edit if you wanna, and then just make sure that everything matches, looks good. This one is gonna be, actually this is the wrong one. Make sure your, your notes match. Cause I almost put the same dial peer on twice. This is dial peer 201. So it's kind of the mirrored opposite. It's, this one is gonna be pattern map one incoming versus incoming pattern map two. And we don't need to specify how many connections. And it's gonna say if you dialed pattern map two versus pattern map one, everything else is the same. Use SIP, use UDP, go to server group two, which is this. So essentially, if you called one of these numbers, go to that IP address. If you called one of these coming in, if, you, if that's the incoming, if pattern map one is the incoming, then use this as the inbound dial peer. And then if these are the called numbers, pattern map one, if that's the called number, then go to server group one, the server. Then in the other direction, if the destination is pattern map two, the public switch telephone networks, it should go to this IP address, server group two, which it does. So if you just draw out the IP addresses and the numbers, then you will be able to see which is the inbound based on the command incoming. And then you'll be able to figure out which dial peers the outbound based on the command destination. Takes a little practice, but that's the logic the router uses 100% of the time. So we have both dial peers. And then if you do want to examine it, I would recommend delete everything that doesn't matter. Like all the optional stuff when you're trying to like troubleshoot, I always delete anything that's optional. Like, yeah, you're using SIP. Yeah, I don't need the descriptions. And then just look at the facts, which are gonna be the incoming for inbound, destination for outbound, session is gonna be where does it go? and then make sure the addresses match with the bind. Everything else is just kind of optional. It, as long as the other stuff is right, the optional stuff works, but it's easy to get caught up in the optional. So I just delete it. Okay, so let's make uh, the second dial peer. Take a look at our router just to see if it uh, passes the smell test. Do we have the voice service VoIP? Yes. Border element, are we allowing SIP to SIP? Yes. Great. We have a voice codec, that's nice, but not mandatory. We have a pattern map, those are our numbers. We have another pattern map for the PSTN. We have a server group, which points to our call manager and a server group, which points to our P PSTN. And then we have dial peers, which tie all these together. 
we have dial piers that tie all of these together. Two dial piers. And then we're, looks like we're in good shape. Now, in order to make this work, I'm gonna go into Unified Communication Manager, make a trunk that points to the router, make a SIP trunk, just say SIP, next. Give it a name, any name, can be whatever you want. Then we're gonna use the default dial device pool. Scroll down, under significant digits, I'm gonna say four. That's for calls coming in. So the reason for that is I've told the router, hey, if you see a 10 digit number, send it to call manager. Okay, that's fine, except I've told the router, if somebody dials 513-555-2001, go to the call manager, which is what this SIP trunk is. The problem is the actual phone that we have only has 2001 as the number. And so if the router passes all of those in and the call manager pays attention to all 10, it's not gonna match the actual number on the phone. <clears throat> it's very common to do this where you have a, a different extension, it needs to match your phone. Many ways to do this. I'm just gonna say, look, only pay attention to four digits. So it's like Thunderdome, 10 come in, four comes out. 10 digits come in and we're gonna just pay attention to the first four. Now that, matches that perfectly. So it's an easy way to fix that issue. Tell the router only pay attention to four, excuse me, tell the server to only pay attention to four digits. The other thing that's mandatory is the IP address. This is the cubes. This is the cubes gigabit zero zero port or IP address. Then we have to apply a security profile and a SIP profile. We're just gonna use the standard, nothing fancy, everything's default, click save. Remember when you click save, this has to be a reflex. It has to be an absolute knee jerk reflex. Whenever you change anything on a SIP trunk and you click save, always reset. Otherwise it will not apply. The trunk must be reset, otherwise it won't work. So always just make it a habit, clicking save and then reset. You get the reset window and then you're like, hey, what? I could reset or restart. What's the difference? They do a good job of explaining that. Every, every time you click reset, restart, it pops up. I'll send it to you if you want to read that for yourself. We're gonna reset it, close it. Now we have a SIP trunk. Then we're gonna go ahead and put it into a route group and a route list, which will associate to the route pattern. We're gonna put the trunk in a group, which gives us the ability to have multiple groups if we wanted. We're only gonna keep it simple. We're gonna use the cube, we'll create a route group, and we'll put our cube in it, which is the name of the trunk. Save. Then we're gonna create a list that has the group. And this gives us redundancy if we have multiple trunks, multiple cubes, multiple gateways. We don't, but it's still good practice to use this. Route list. We're gonna attach the call manager group, which is just which server to use. Click save. Then we're gonna put our route group into the route list. Add the group. If we wanted to change the numbers, we could do that here. Click save, if we wanted to use the external number mask, we could turn it on here and it will use the external mask of our phones. When calls go out, we can do it in one place. Again, there's that nice reset or you could apply, it will take the least restrictive method. We're gonna reset. And then we can go take a look at our, we have to go to our route patterns and then connect our patterns to the list. Normally this is the last step. You create the pattern, link it to the list. So if you dial 011, any number ending with pound, use the route list. Save. Click okay, click save, go on to the next. Normally you create these from scratch. I already had them there. And since I deleted my trunk, they're still there. Normally you can't make a pattern without a trunk or a list. 
I created the patterns, linked them to a trunk, and then deleted the trunk, so they're still sitting there. But if you dial local, long distance, international, or emergency, they will all point to the same list, which contains the same group, which contains our single trunk. We have one more to go. Then we should be able to test our call. Okay, let's grab our phone for this demonstration. Okay, let me resize this guy. Ah, it likes to take over my whole screen. Okay. It'll resize. There we go. Then let me go in, point my phones. One is going to be, uh, I'll show you that. One is going to be the PSTN. And then the other. is going to be So what I have, just so you're aware, and then we'll test the call and we'll wrap this up. What we have is two phones and they're both on the same computer, but they're, they're representing two different things here. We've got one phone, which is registered to Unified Communication Manager. This is the 2001 phone. Then we have another phone, which is the public switch telephone has local long distance international emergency. And this is registered to a PSTN device, which we'll just use red. This guy's registered to a public switch telephone network device. And so, and then it has local long distance international and that's out there. And then our cube is out or our call manager. And then we have our cube. And so our, we have a SIP trunk here, and then we have a SIP trunk to there. This is the 10 250 and we're going to be pointing to that. And so our call is going to go through the cube. I'm going to go to the cube and I'm going to turn on debugging and we should be able to see the SIP call as it goes through. And we'll go to the router. We're going to go into logging buffered, I'll increase the buffer size, and then uh, logging buffered, no logging console. Okay, no, yeah, I'm consoled in. Then clear log, debug, CC SIP messages. That'll show us our SIP messages. Should be in good shape. Let's give it a shot and see what we get. So this public switch telephone network has local long distance international on it and we can call it and there it is. Hello. We can double click on the question or the the I shows us we're using G711 ULA, how many bytes we're sending, et cetera. 
hang up. Now, let's go take a look at our cube. Cisco has a free program, which I don't have a lot of time to get into, called Translator X, and it will read trace files. We can go to our router, show log. It will show us the log, which is the call. We can then highlight the call. This is all SIP. It's one call. And in the SIP class, we go over what each, each of these lines do. We go over this whole process. I'm just gonna copy the single SIP call and I'll put it into a new text file. There's our call. We can see the cube sitting there minding its own business. And then it receives an invite. And then it sends a message saying, okay, I'll try. And then it sends the invite. Well, we can see this. And I will save this to my desktop. I'll save this as a SIP call trace or SIP call trace, save it. And then what I'll do is we'll minimize these things. And I'll show you SIP call trace. And then we've got translator X and we can just drag and drop the call right in. And there's the call. We can see the call. And if we click down here under generate diagram, lower right hand corner, it shows us a picture of the call. And we can see translator X is free. We can read call traces with it. Uh, individual traces, we can go to call manager and read historic traces with translator X. It's a wonderful program. But what we can see is that we have the cube. This is the cube's inside address. So the cube is here and the call manager is here, sends the SIP message, invite, we send to 100, got it. We send an invite to the PSTN, they send us, yeah, we're working on it, we wait. Then the PSTN sends us, Then the PSTN sends us a 180 ringing. So something out here is ringing. We then send the 180 ringing to the call manager. Hey man, it's ringing. And then call manager tells the phone that made the call, hey, the thing out here is ringing. So the ring back plays in our ear. And we wait, we sent a request. They sent the request we need a final response. A final response is a two, three, four, five or 600 response. We get a 200 final response from the PSTN telling us success. 200 means success. So the PSTN says success because I answered. So we sent a request, they gave us a final response, and then we have to acknowledge the final response. All SIP messages, SIP is based on request, response, acknowledge. Request, 200 final response, we acknowledge that they received it. They sent us a request. We gave them a 200 final response. They acknowledged they received it. Both sides do this separately. Both sides are separate. Then they have a phone call. At some point, somebody hangs up. Whoever hangs up sends a buy request. Capital letters, buy, it's a request. We send a 200, we send a response. We are responding to your request. We then send a buy request. They send a 200 response. That's a 100% normal standard SIP call. It doesn't get any more normal than that. That brings my demonstration to a close. What I'm going to do is save the configuration, put it in the chat window. If you want a copy of it, you can download it. I appreciate your, uh, your, your being here, participation. I hope it was useful. I hope it gave you an idea of what it is that we're doing when we configure a SIP cube. If that was something new, perhaps you have lots of experience with this. Hopefully we showed you something different, something interesting. If you have any questions, now's a fine time to ask while I'm getting the, um, I'll put the SIP trace and the router commands. If you want either one of them, you can have them. I'll put them both in the chat window. If you have any questions, please feel free.